Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today at this historic Triple IT event. We are very happy to have Dato Siri Anwar Ibrahim giving a lecture on conscientious governance today. Um, before we begin, I would just like to make a few brief announcements. Um, so, just so that you know, um, if anyone would like to use the, the restroom, it's upstairs, it's located upstairs. Um, also, for the Yasser prayer, Maghrib should come in around 5.40, but our program will end around 5. Um, and so you can either pray Asr then, or if you'd like to excuse yourself beforehand to pray Asr, you're more than welcome, the Masallah is, is open. Um, there are a few other uh, triple IT announcements. We have a summer student program that's taking place this summer, in um, and your app and the deadline to apply for that is March fifteenth. It's an intensive uh, Islamic studies based program. Uh, we also have a new master's degree program in coordination with American University, and students can take classes at either American University or at triple IT. Um, and if you'd like more information about that, you can visit our website at triplet.org. Um, please be sure to follow us on social media as well and tune into our podcast, Third Space Thoughts to Policy, on iTunes and Spotify. Um, and now I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Hisham Atalab, who is the president and founder, one of the presidents and one of the founders of Triple IT and current president, um, who will give our welcoming remarks and introduce our very special lecturer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to bless this gathering with a few, three verses from Surah Yusuf because I think it's relevant to our function. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qala rabbi sijnu ahabbu ilayya mimma yad'unani ilayh. وإلا تصرف عني كيدهن أصب إليهن وأكم من الجاهلين فاستجاب له ربه فصرف عنه كيدهن إنه هو السميع العليم ثم بدأ لهم من بعد ما رأوا الآيات لا يزجنونه حتى حين. Brothers and sisters. These are three verses from chapter Yusuf, Surah Yusuf, and it is applicable to our guest today. Yusuf said, oh my Lord, the prison is more to my liking than what they are calling me, inviting me to do. And if you don't avert their plot against me, I may incline to them and I'll be among the ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his Lord, answered his prayer and he averted their plan from him. He is all-knowing, all-hearing. Then it appeared to them, to the administration, after they saw the signs, that they will imprison him for some time. I'll come to this at the end, inshallah, explain the relevance. There are a conventional way of introducing someone and unconventional. I'll go the unconventional way. There is a mental hospital in Baghdad called Mustafa Shama Mustashfa Shama'iyya. And whenever they appoint a manager, he either resigns or he got, gets fired. Until the fifth one came and he was very successful. So Amin al asima which is the mayor of Baghdad, is, as is called, he threw a big party for this um, successful manager. And everything said and done. At the end, they, he came to the speak to the successful doctor. And he said, I want to ask the population of the prison, all the crazies, why is it that so many people failed before me and I am successful here. So the chief of the crazies stood up and he said, doctor, we consider you one of us, you are our chairman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think I am qualified to speak about our dear brother Datu Siri Anwar Ibrahim because I have known him for 45 years. He started in the 70s forming ABIM, the Malaysian Muslim uh, Youth Association. And then he became a member of IFSA, Inter IFSO, International Islamic Federation Organization, and a member of WAMI, World Assembly of Muslim Youth, representing East Asia. And then he came here in 1975 at Peoria, Illinois, where I was living there, and he established MISG, Malaysian Islamic Study Group. So he was in this student movement from beg the beginning, and he was the founder and the leader of those organizations. In 1982, I was conducting an IFSO and WAMI camp in Kuala Lumpur. And there I met Brother Anwar, and he was, as a head of ABIM, was, uh, was uh, asked by the leader of the Omna, Omno party, the governing uh, party, the government, to join them. So he consulted and consulted and consulted. You remember, Brother Anwar, how much you consulted? And finally, he took the decision with his group that, yes, the majority said you should go and do more good work than just being in Abim. So alhamdulillah, that is how uh, he, he started. Then when he joined, he got several posts. He was appointed as Minister of Youth and Culture, Culture and Civilization, then Minister of Agriculture, then Minister of Education, then Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister in the 90s. So he, has, he was trained to be really professional in so many areas. Now, I would like to touch on four aspects of his personality, and I will give one hour to each one of them. <laughs> so you'll be here staying four hours. Huh? Politically speaking, he is a man of democracy, rule of law, anti-corruption, reformacy, reformation, diversity, pluralism, poverty eradication, and governance. Good governance. That's why he is going to lecture to us, inshallah, about conscientious governance. Number two, as a finance minister, it suffices to describe him as, in the words of Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister of England, of Britain, she said, if I have to form a team of football players among the ministers of finances. Anwar Ibrahim will be the captain of that team. Right, Brother Anwar, you remember that? In East Asia uh, Time magazine, it was published. Number two, number three. He is a man of principle, morality, character, integrity, qualities that you, you find very rare among politicians. That's why I describe him as a Muslim politician modern model in this era. There are several instances that I can quote personally to, to, to illustrate this. We had lunch in Sheikh Taha Rahmatullah home in 1988, and as we were leaving in the outside the home, we were telling him, Brother Anwar, you are so vocal against the cronies and the corrupt people and nepotism and so on. 
why don't you a little bit slow down? He said, silence now is a betrayal. And he got the prison after that few days. Then in 2013, Dr. Jamal Rahimallah and myself, we sensed that they are going to uh, again put him into prison. So we said, Anwar, why don't you stay out of the country? Because you will be more useful outside than inside. He said, I cannot let down the millions of Malaysian supporters and stay outside. I call him, uh, describe him as an F and F man, meaning forget and forgive. And you remember what Mahathir did against him and he imprisoned him. But when lately, a couple of years ago, Anwar was in prison and he thought that the corruption in Malaysia has to be ended and when Mahathir proposed to him coalition to help each other, Anwar said, yes, I forgive and forget and let us work and alhamdulillah, as you know, in last May, they both won the election. So it's not easy because many people, as you have read in the literature, how come Anwar put his hand with Mahathir the, who did so and so to him? But mashallah, out of his character and forgiveness, he did the right thing. Number four, his priority, I think one of his main legacies is education, education, and education. As you know, he was a minister of education. He told me that we are a country, we cannot put a budget for defense and military very high because no, 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 how much we actually put for the defense department, uh, part of the budget. We have China, we have Indonesia, we have Japan, our neighbors, we cannot compete with them. So what we do, he said he, in his uh, budget, when he was finance minister, he put about 24% of the GDP to go for education. And he said, the, the, the real dealing with these neighbors is not through military, it is through trade, education, and common projects that we, and what, that's what he did very successfully. One important thing happened in 2012. The late Dr. Jamal Berzinci formed an education committee. He was the chairman and Brother Anwar was the co-chairman. And there were four other members, Professor Abdel Lohab Al-Effendi, Dr. Zia Din Sardar, Dr. Anas Sheikh Ali, and Jeremy Hensel Thomas. They formed this the Committee of Education, Advancing Education in Muslim Societies, because they believe that the way to rekindle the true onset of Islamic secularization in this 21st century is to go through education and this is the focus uh, of triple IT. Now, as I promise you, I started with uh, verses about Yusuf alayhi salam. When he was pardoned, Anwar, in May from the prison, the Sultan pardoned him. You see in the newspapers that Anwar is like Yusuf alayhi salam from the prison to power. And there are several similarities here. First of all, you know he is the cousin of Yusuf because they have the same last name. Yusuf ibn Yaqub ibn Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. And you have here Anwar bin Ibrahim. <laughs> Actually, we are all cousins of each other, as you know. 
شيخ طه هازثيري رحمة الله عليه that the enemies of truth they accuse and slander the good people, the honest people, the straight people with some accusations that all uh, fake news. For example, if somebody is patriotic, they will accuse him of, oh, he is an agent of a foreign power, or he is a thief and corrupt and so on. If somebody is a good Muslim and clean, they accuse him of sex scandals. Yusuf alayhi salam was accused of this relationship with Imra'atul Aziz. And the new version of that in this 21st century is sodomy, homosexuality. That's w that is what was accused for Brother Ibrahim. And his innocence, alhamdulillah, is very clear. In fact, as an example, Sheikh Taha was give, giving us some uh, incidents. He said, for example, Sheikh Muhammad Mahmoud al-Sawaf, who is the leader of the Islamic movement, rahmatullah, in, in Iraq, they were accusing him of, oh, we saw him going away uh, in and out of the American embassy or the British embassy. Or his daughter has uh, boyfriends. In fact, his daughter was only six years old. So you see here the accusations and the similarity bit between Brother Anwar and Yusuf alayhi salam. So just like Yusuf said, قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيَّ The sijin, the prison is better for me than what they are calling me for. Finally, the description of Yusuf to himself, about himself. He said, Inni hafidun alim. I am honest and professional. And as you can see, here we have an example, a model example of Brother Rain. He is really honest and professional through his training in the government. So I will present to you our chairman, Datu Siri Anwar Ibrahim. He will speak of conscientious governance. As you know, governance is very easy if it is not correct. But if you have conscientious, even the word is oh, difficult, conscientious, right? Conscientious. <laughs> so without uh, further delay, Brother Anwar Ibrahim, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulil kareem. Dr. Hisham, distinguished uh, friends, um, I am of course delighted as always to be back here. My only concern is every time I get to uh, the Tipaiti, when I went back, I go back to prison. <laughs> 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 but this time, alhamdulillah, I think um, we have made uh, history. Uh, it's quite unprecedented that um, we could garner enough support among Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists in Malaysia to affect change. Uh, this is a period when racism seems to be on the increase here and particularly so in Europe. Uh, where religious strife among Muslims and uh, in India, Muslims and Hindus is also on, on, the, on, on the rise. But I'm alhamdulillah glad to say that Malaysia seems to be going against that trend. Uh, it's easier said than done because a racist appeal, racism, and religious bigotry can be very pronounced. And um, though there are elements that would continue to propagate such sentiments, but by and large, Malaysians were able to affect change through the ballot box without one life lost in the process. 
and and uh, we happen to be a majority Muslim country. So it's not only despair and gloom. There is also a possibility of change with yaqeen and uh, with the mission, inshallah, and with the support of the people. I always say, I mean, here, my colleagues uh, know other than Hisham, Marhum, Jamal, Sheikh Taha, I always say other than our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also in our faith in the values and the wisdom of our people. Um, the wisdom of the masses. Now, wisdom, the belief in the masses has also been um, well formulated by a great Spanish uh, thinker, Ortega Huaygaset, in his Rebellion de las Masas. Revolt of the masses, not the revolt in the revolution, but in terms of creating this awareness, uh, which is very critical. Um, the, our problem and our challenge in discussing, for example, the issue of conscientious government or governance is because academics and elites think that they have all the answers, they formulate ideas that doesn't seem necessarily to connect with the aspirations of the masses. I was in the African American History Museum yesterday. I deliberately chose to spend there a few hours. It is a remarkable and uh, ingenious effort, and it is to me extremely uh, effective in uh, understanding the antecedents of history. Uh, you are aware of some of the literature on the subject, including. Dan Hesi quotes a uh, recent uh, book uh, to understand, not only to be able to uh, continue this rhetoric about uh, racism and independence and liberty and democracy, but to understand the atrocities, atrocities the crime inflicted on a community, in this case, the blacks which uh, the attempts are to defeat the entire dignity, confidence. Although we talk about liberty or democracy, this will not change and alter unless the entire psyche can be altered and changed. So, We, uh, as, as I see it, the issue of governance, conscientious governan gover governance, why in simple terms, good governance, there's some very prominent academics here, that's why I choose some uh, complicated terms to impress them. Uh, but, <laughs> but essentially what I mean is, what is in deficit? What is in deficit is not just democracy. It is good, responsible, transparent, accountable government, which uh, Fukuyama, at least these days, talk about democratic accountability. We may disagree with Fukuyama in some areas, but on this issue of democratic accountability, I think he is right. It's just not democracy, but the accountability associated with the entire transformation or change. Now, um, and this is not necessarily something new. You know, after the French Revolution, liberty, egality, fraternity, it is there, strongly embedded, as part of our religious, cultural tradition. But as always, whether in our understanding of the Quran, is not, not necessarily reflected in our actions. We talk about rahmat al alameen, but in the name of Islam, we can be racist and by gods. Contradicting the essence and the values promoted by our own religion or religious values. I'm not here to concern about uh, the design of the rest. American or European 
I'm more concerned about the internal dynamics within Muslim societies. Why we are not able to surpass these old prejudices which our faith demand us to such a change. Now, I said that this uh, antecedents of history would suffice at least to give the fundamental principles and values. We talk about uh, our understanding of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. When I grew up, Salahuddin was a great leader because he could defeat Richard the Lionheart and the Crusades. But we begin to learn, we appreciate the fact that it is more than that. His contribution is not just defeating the European power. His contribution is because he created a new culture, a culture of knowledge, culture of discipline, of values, of ethics in governance. And, and, and I was clearly, personally, at the personal level, was surprised that, I mean, I mean, I think the works of Amin Ma'aluf and some others too, that the first 10 years, his concern was not extending territories or fighting the rest. His concern was to consolidate governance, consolidate what he has, making sure that most religious institutions, educational institutions, become the place of learning, acquiring knowledge, and practicing the deen, and understanding the Islamic mission. In order to do that, he has to enhance trade relations, invest, invite Muslims, Christians, regardless. So he managed to work with Christian kingdoms or protectorate just to make sure that the country can propel economic growth. Because then, both the educational institutions or social uh, uh, programs, and of course, even the army at the time that Islam was under siege, could be managed. I mean, I think it is important for our scholars, for example, to attempt to introduce these great leaders in this context, not only as a great hero because of his ability to master a major armed forces to defeat during the, uh, the, the Crusaders, but to me, more significant <coughs> is the first decade of governance where governance and consensus governance and to connect with the demands and aspirations of his own people is pertinent. Now, <clears throat> I was also uh, uh, made to be aware that this whole celebration of Maulid Rasul, which also happens to be a controversy now in Pakistan, when Imran Khan says that he wants to be to make sure that Maulid Rasul becomes a national sort of program agenda. In Malaysia, we do celebrate Maulid Rasul. Because um, some, you know, how have you Salafi say it is bid'ah, uh, dalala, and, uh, you know, bid'ah, dalala means nar is the place. Uh, I said, uh, I'm sure Allah is more forgiving. He will not send me to hell just because I have Maulud. But what the, 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 the legitimate criticism in the celebration of the Prophet's birthday can be found if it is just a celebration of rituals. I remember in one of the basic uh, verses in the Quran and our initial trainings, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu istajibu lillahi wa lirrasul idha da'akum lima yuhyikum is always a reference to the rhetoric or the idea of da'wah and actualization in practice. 
Actualization is a favorite term used by Marhum Farouki. Actualization of the ideal. But it is the amal. It's always da'wah wa amila. Salihan wa qala innani min al-Muslimin. It's always reference to that. And that, that is terribly lacking. You go to all these so-called tazkira in the mosque, including in Malaysia. Oh my word. They have all the answers in the world. You talk about artificial intelligence or whatever. You ask any question of the war in Iraq or the, in Lebanon, they have all the answers in the world. You know why? Because they don't follow. They say, why is the problem there? Because we don't follow the Quran. Period. And uh, so this simplistic sort of a formulation is certainly not uh, helpful because you don't address. And we have to have the humility to acknowledge that there are limitations. We don't have all the answers. I preempt this because I anticipate Syed Muhammad Syed is going to be asked to, uh, asking me to have some difficult questions, and I'm telling you that I have to have all the answers. <laughs> and they say, what? You have a great experience. I say, I spend more time in jail than outside. And uh, Hisham is a great friend, so he talks about all the ministerial positions that I've had, I've held. But he forgot to mention that I was 11 years in jail. Uh, the only advantage is I'm able to read all books possible. So Tipaiti and, 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 and um, Jamal will make sure they get all the necessary titles. So, but it was very, that's why I know about Salahuddin, because he's, Jamal was Kurdi. So very biased. <laughs> <laughs> now, so I, my, my point is this, that um, the, the deficit is governance. People say, I'm always this engaged in this battle with Abdul Hamid, Abu Sulaiman, the great brother, who says, it's education, brother. It's Islamic education. It's understanding. Yes, of course. But I said, without governance, who is going to disburse that education? Who is going to give this creative environment to allow you for a reasoned discourse that is essential in formulating ideas and free flow of ideas and exchange? Therefore, all the limitations that you hear in the West, including the United States, is less than or, or minor compared to the limitations in Muslim countries and Muslim societies and developing economies. If we do not have this freedom and creative environment where creative thinking and creative thought is being encouraged, and we cannot have conscious government without freedom, of course, but with uh, 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 good governance, you can therefore, allow for this creative thinking and more. So I'm not saying that you discard all programs, including close down triple IT, and go back and start working for uh, regime change. I'm not, I do not promote this idea. But what I'm saying is that do not preclude this as a one of the major issues that we have to contend with. Because I think uh, who decides whether there's a creative uh, thinking to be allowed in educational institutions or not, is the government. Who decides how much money is to be disbursed for education or public health? So whatever one may, uh, uh, ideas or views or criticism against uh, President Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, his success, to my mind, to a large extent, is to encourage, the, uh, to disburse huge sums for education and, and one of the best public health programs in any Muslim country other than infrastructure. But that is due to government enterprise. And um, again, I said, historic incidents, other than Salahud al Ayubi, of course, this, this classic uh, letter from uh, Khalif Ali bin Abi Talib an, to the Egyptian governor Malik Ashtar, 
which which I thought uh, need to be republished with the notes and references uh, because the ethical dimension in terms of and go in governance is so compelling in this uh, short treatise. I know people have written about it with uh, annotations, but, but I think uh, given the present scenario and the challenges in the contemporary period, probably there's a new assignment for Tipaiti to look, relook at some of the classic texts on governance and with a strong emphasis on integrity of leadership uh, because um, the failure of governance is because of the failure of leadership. Uh, of, uh, notwithstanding if there are, of course, outside forces uh, intrusion into the domestic affairs, but otherwise is the failure of leadership. And the uh, short treatise uh, in this letter is, of course, one of the most compelling cases on governance and ethics ever written. Although we can bring uh, Cicero uh, and the rest of the classics, but this is important and I think um, we need to relook at it. We tried, I remember one of the first things I did uh, as a uh, young minister in government is to persuade uh, Dr. Mahathir, then the Prime Minister, to use this to encourage people to understand ethics because otherwise we have to battle with the so-called Islamists who talks about application of the hudud. Um, in the absence of education, understanding, awareness, or even ethics in governance, it's just hudud. You implement it, then you are Islamic because you follow the Quran. With an ethics part of the Quran or governance part of the Quran, uh, that's of course not uh, a priority as far as they are concerned, and I think it's still a major issue that we in the Muslim world have to face between uh, good governance, conscientious governance, governance and applying strict, immediate application of Islamic laws. As I said, this is a major problem in the Muslim world. Uh, I remember Sheikh Yusuf al-Haradawi, soon after we won the elections in Malaysia, managed to speak to me, rang me up. I, I, technically, I was still in prison, or in the hospital, but uh, once we won, then the prison staff immediately allowed me to speak. <laughs> I had no access to telephones or radio or television or newspapers because I was solitary confinement. Uh, but there's a reality in, in politics. We won. So he said, but he, he said something, something very pertinent to my point here. Because he said, the last few years have been uh, news of despair and gloom and frustration. Uh, but I have heard, after all these years, at least one glimmer of hope and a, a, a positive story from Malaysia that we have this new wave of uh, change, uh, p people gaining, uh, supporting uh, a, a demand for change. And we did it, uh, but again, I say in humility, it is not easy because um, we have high expectations. People expect you to change. Read the country of corruption and the abuse of power. Immediately have free media, judicial independence, and relieve some of the major economic hardships in the country. When the country is destroyed, when billions of dollars are being plundered, it's not easy to then affect change. Because economic growth would require correct policies, and policy adjustments, new investments, before we could embark on some new initiatives. Um, but inshallah, now um, Dr. Mahathir is back in power, supported by us. 
and um, I will, inshallah, assume that responsibility at the right time. Because there is also uh, because so many friends ask, "Are you sure?" No, are you sure? I said, "Nobody is sure." It's fatawakkal ala Allah. Inna Allah yuhibbul mutawakkilin. That's the best with the answer. But then we have entered into this agreement, and I know, I know, everything is awfu bil uqud. So the agreement uh, stands as it is, and inshallah, we, it will prevail. Now let me uh, also mention other than this problem of good governance is, is to deal with high expectations, is also to, to, to accept that the entire environment have changed. You know, once the media is free, a country has to grapple with a new entity. For example, it's easier to criticize leaders now, which was unheard of before. You can have the mainstream media to, to questioning some of the prime minister's remarks. It's happening now. And some of uh, our people said they're not ready. How do you have a prime minister being criticized? As I used to say before, of course, if you do in the past, you have freedom of speech, but you don't have freedom after speech. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they say, no, there's no freedom of speech in Egypt. I say, no, you're wrong. You have freedom of speech. But what happens afterwards, good luck to you. Now, um, so we have that uh, issue. For example, uh, do you then allow people to express their views on sexual orientation? I said, if this a new regime, you must allow them to express their views. Because we must have the confidence that we can counter these arguments in a reasoned discourse. Particularly in Malaysia, it's stronger because not only Muslims would want and believe in the sanctity of marriage between men and women, but the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, by and large, would support that. But then to deny people from expressing their views would be difficult because you come on a... Uh, manifesto and a promise you must allow people even if you choose to disagree with them based on Islam or constitutional guarantees and provisions you must allow them to express their views but we have to then navigate these new problems now and then we have to deal with the mushrooming of civil society my main uh, concern or issue is this like the great economies and planners, there's sometimes disconnect between the actual problems confronting our society and the more sophisticated understanding of Keynesian, post-Keynesian, GDP and investments, portfolio, etc. That's what their discourse is. But there is grinding poverty, the gross inequality in our midst, which must be addressed, which have to be addressed, which is of little concern of many of the civil society organizations. Because every group has their own priority or their own agenda. But to us, a major problem is a government, as you read, have you read in Malik Ashtar's account, the whole basis of governance and raison d'etre of a regime is to ensure that the demand of every single citizen must be met at our level best. There's no clearer example than Omar Abdul Aziz in this. In two and a half years to be able to deal with basic problems of poverty in the midst of plenty. So I think, um, not that I'm, I'm not people, uh, some of my colleagues in the civil society question, look, Anwar, we were all there for you since 98. You, when you were in prison, we were there speaking for you. I said, it's true. I I'm, I'm, I'm accept their role. But I'm saying, let us re-look at the agenda, look at the priority. It's not just statistics and figures. Governments have a tendency to give statistics. We have been successful from 40% poverty to 15%. From you know, gross inequality of Gini, uh, Gini coefficient of certain percentage to less, or whatever. Or public health, from one doctor to 10,000 people to one doctor to 600 people. 
okay, impressive statistics. But if you happen to be in that 10% poverty, or you happen to be in the uh, category they don't have access to medical uh, help or, or facilities, or good ed quality education, then you have a problem. So I think the, the danger of statistics, even if they don't lie, because statistics do lie, as you know, even if they don't lie, rest in this issue of being cast aside because you look at the rosy picture, which can be misleading. And I think I represent a different view. I said, as long as there is injustice to one person, it is the duty of government and the rulers to deal with it. And you cannot say, no, we have dealt with 70%, uh, 30%, they can wait for the next 10 years. What if the, that 30% happens to be your child? Would you say or give the same answer? I think this is the issue of dignity and integrity of our people. So I think um, that's to my mind sustainability. We talk about economic sustainability or social, but sustainability in the immediate and medium term would mean the rise growth, economic and social, of any country that would guarantee a service, justice to its citizens. I would end by saying that um, as I have already strongly encouraged uh, IT as an institution to f also focus on governance in the context of Makhaseh. Our traditional views have to change according to the dictates of the times. In Malaysia, I happen to have played a small role in encouraging the setting up of the Islamic banks and uh, we become quite uh, rather successful compared to most countries. And um, when I became Minister of Finance, the moment I transferred the, our reserves uh, the, the, from the conventional banks to the Islamic Bank, immediately the Islamic Bank grew as a major bank in the country. But now, as formulated by Najatullah Siddiqui himself in some of the recent articles. Najatullah Siddiqui, as you know, is the Indian economist who have written, who have been pushing for setting up Islamic banks since the 70s. Very effective and very influential. But uh, in his uh, recent writings, he has been most critical. This is rare for an academician. He said, not that I was wrong, but I think no people don't build from my initial ideas either than introducing new instruments. What is new instruments? New instruments is what was being introduced by the conventional banks that we halal, we Islamize it. We're making it halal, halas. But making halal is certainly not part, it's only a small portion of part of Islamic economics. You see, it must be re-looked uh, re from the context of the maqasid. Why the higher objectives of the sharia and of Islam? is justice. is participation. is is solving the basic problems of the economy. The Islamic banks, finally, have to be assessed from the profit of each bank. I'm, I must confess, I, I used to serve in, in the Baraka Bank for a long time. And uh, this has been the major internal battle with the banking system. So that is why I think um, to rethink and relook. And this is the role of governance. The leadership has to provoke and push for reforms. Is islah bastata? What is reform to the best of your ability in the Quranic term? 
peace in every field and every sphere so that it comes back into the maqasid, which in terms of governance, which means to guarantee peace and security and also economic, socioeconomic justice. And again, this is in, in Shatibi's uh, Mawafaqat, in, in uh, referring to the dialogue between Malik and his father, Omar Abdul Aziz. The priorities are laid down very clearly there. So may I again thank you uh, for being patient enough. I've been patient for a long time in jail, so uh, for <laughs> exceeding five minutes, I can be excused. But thanking uh, Hisham and colleagues at IPIT and wish them uh, well in this enterprise. But incidentally, this morning, uh, before I reach here, I, of course, spent some time in the cemetery because uh, to remember the great contribution of our teachers, brothers, including Sheikh Baha Jabir al-Alawani, um, a great teacher to us, to me, my family, to many of us, and of course a great brother, Jamal Barzanji, and Jaghlid and uh, Mona Abu Fadl, and it uh, gives me real pleasure. One of the things I thought I should do when I was in prison and uh, hearing about uh, the demise of these great brothers and sister is to say that I must get back to the States, uh, not to be honored or to be giving speeches, but at least to visit and recite uh, some Quranic verses in remembrance of this great uh, du'at thinkers. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. In fact, allow me to stand there. It's a difficult act to follow after um, soon to be, inshallah, the Prime Minister of Malaysia uh, and, and such a, um, an inspiring profile. Um, Nonetheless, because he will have such an inspiring and important role, um, he will be, inshallah, a ruler of such an important and inspiring place. Um, I feel that it's my responsibility to be demanding. Um, and if I wanted to praise him, the 15 minutes I have, um, are too short for somebody who has um, commanded our admiration since I remember um, as a very young man before I started learning. Um, so I will not do that. I will uh, rather highlight some of the points that he made and um, hope that these conversations that we start here today will continue to resonate in his actual practice of governance. And that we as academics and students and Muslim thinkers are going to be both supportive and demanding and critical at the same time uh, when he faces his own challenges and dilemmas and, and, and conflicts. As the Prophet Sallallahu says in a hadith that somebody who has been given this responsibility of ruling, ruling between people or ruling over people has been slaughtered with a blunt knife. Yet at the same time, 
a just ruler, the Prophet ﷺ said, will be among the seven who will be in the shade of the divine throne on the day of judgment. There are two ways of thinking about society that have emerged in the recent decades in the Muslim world. One, and I'm talking about Islamic thinkers, the ulama, uh, various groupings of ulama. And of course, there is a third, the bigger uh, option, which is available to all of us, which is to forget about Islam. Islam as a model of thinking is embarrassing. Uh, we should think about it, politics, political realism. We should think about development and growth. We should think about uh, 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 geopolitics. But Islam is an embarrassment that must fit uh, all the given categories of governance or whatever uh, is in vogue in terms of world institutions or decisions that have been made. Uh, and we should simply find Islamic terms to justify what's there. And I was very pleased when uh, Dr. Anwar Ibrahim um, brought up some of the examples that show how carefully he has been reading Islamic literature. The letter of Imam Ali to Malik al-Ashtar, uh, which is, I should say, I am writing, in fact, for a triple IT, a book of, of survey of Islamic history in which I begin with the example of Ali radiallahu anh as a ruler, and then I go on and focus on uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And so I will take both of those uh, recommendations you made under advisement, and I will send that a draft of that book before I publish it, um, inshallah. And I will come back to the topic of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz later. Um, the first way of thinking that is in fact in power in the Muslim world, within now moving to Islamic thinking, is that scholars, ulama, both in the Muslim world and in many in the West have decided for some strange reason that Islam can prosper only under conditions of oppression when forced. So that we must have dictators, we must have autocrats, that we must accept the first principle of Islam as complete and total obedience to Waliul Amr, whoever happens to be the ruler. This position, in fact, has become recently, after the Arab uprising of 2011, the reactionary position that began, in fact, has become the dominant position. And of all places in the United States where um, we are supposed to have experienced both of democracy and freedom. Um, this is becoming a, a way of us thinking about Islam that is, in fact, quite in, quite in vogue. It is almost seen as to think about the other way, which is that the possibility of social justice, the possibility of good redistribution of wealth, is seen as Marxism un-Islamic and problematic. And that is why I am so uplifted to hear uh, Anwar Ibrahim's remarks. And of course I pray and hope and I demand of him that he, he not disappoint our hopes. Um, it is possible, not only possible, but I, I am sometimes shocked at the Islamic discourse that comes out of the official circles in the Muslim world, as well as here, that social justice is seen as some kind of undercover Marxism. How is that possible for people who read a book like the Quran that says, Ya ladina amanu kun qawwamina bil qisti shuhada lillah. In one verse, and Ya ladina amanu kun qawwamina lillah shuhada bil qist. 
that justice is such a central part of our deen? How is it possible that people who follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and whose heroes are Umar and Umar ibn Aziz and Ali, how is it possible that they think of adil, justice, as a bad word? As a word that leads to necessarily khuruj uh, al-hakim, rebellion, and therefore is un-Islamic. So um, it is greatly uplifting that another model is emerging. Um, so, with that said, I'm simply going to offer as, um, as the editor of the American Journal of Islamic Social Sciences um, and as a member of the American Muslim um, network of intellectuals, um, somebody who's involved with IIIT and, and elsewhere, um, that we take your model, your inspirations um, seriously. We hope that you will indeed do what Umar ibn Abdul Aziz did. And let me just very quickly summarize what I think I find most inspiring about him. Uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who is considered a great nation builder, great, sorry, great state builder, uh, the great uh, uh, founder, if you will, of the Marwana dynasty. He was known as Hamam al-Masajid, the uh, pigeon of the mosques before he became the Khalifa. And he was so knowledgeable that um, people would say that had he not been a Khalifa, he would have been one of the Imams of Fiqh. But when he became the Khalifa, um, he left some of that, if not most of it, behind. And the ulama who look at this, or historians, put these words in his mouth that he says when he heard that he has become the Khalifa after the death of his father, Marwan ibn Abdul Malik, هذا فراق بيني وبينك. This is the separation between you, the Quran, and me. And so when he became the Khalifa, he was a realist in the sense that if some people needed to be eliminated in order for his power to be stable, they were eliminated very effectively, which does not mean he was not a good Muslim. He was, in fact, a Muslim as far as he knew it. He just knew how to set aside certain demands of his deen when there was the necessity to do that. And then there were examples of Islamic idealists idealists, including Ali radiallahu anh, and Abdullah ibn Zubair, who had in fact, in practice, and this is going to ruffle some feathers, but as a historian, in practice, they failed in putting their ideas into practice. <coughs> in fact, they were speaking to people, Abdullah ibn Zubair and Ali radiallahu anh, both, who, whom they did not understand meaning Ali radiallahu was practically born into Islam, as was Abdullah ibn Zubayr, and we were talking to, to Arabs who had converted to Islam after the, the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So when they spoke, um, there was almost two generational gap. These Arabs thought Islam and their Arab tribalism was one and the same thing. When Ali and Abdullah ibn Zubayr were trying to say to them, there's something else, these ideals. And... So they, in fact, could not govern successfully, despite the fact that they were uh, Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu and Khulafa. Uh, Ali radiallahu anh was fourth uh, Khalifa al-Rashid, and his model continues to inspire us today. But when Ab Umar ibn Abd Aziz came to power, this was the most remarkable um, feat that he had, that he, in fact, was able to bring those ideals and put them into practice because he knew the people very well that he was in fact had a political gift as well as he was uh, inspired to pray and cry at night. But if you look at his financial, for example, 
uh, one of the letters that he writes to his governor is called Financial Rescript of Omar Ibn Aziz. Uh, the article is available. It's a, 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 a really a model of good governance because it does not destroy everything that the Marwanis had built, and rather it uses uh, a very good policy. And one of the, some of the things that he does uh, is one, fight the kind of racism that had become synonymous, of course, with the Marwanid government, which was the non-Arab Muslims were not equal to Arab Muslims. So racism of a certain kind, right, was central, one of his central problems. The other problem, that he rolls back jihad on the western frontier with the Byzantines because it was leading to an enormous number of deaths without much results. He doesn't you know, roll back jihad everywhere, but, uh, but in, the, in the Byzantine, and so he, where he says the life even of a single Muslim is more important to me than the, uh, than the territory one. And there are many other examples which, which, which is why I, um, in, in the book uh, that I'm writing, I put Omar ibn al-Aziz at the center as a, a very remarkable person who uh, was able to show to the world that the model of governance that emerged with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and with the first four caliphs was not suitable just for the small state or, or village of Medina, but rather you could govern an empire with it. The world, the greatest world empire at the time. And, um, and, and so I was very pleased to hear that, that uh, those were models that, that you brought up in your talk. Um, I was just told that I should introduce myself. Um, <laughs> well, my name is Awaymir Anjum and I uh, am uh, professor of Islamic Intellectual History and Islamic Studies and Endowed Chair uh, of Islamic um, Studies at the University of Toledo, Ohio, and also the editor of American Journal of Islamic Social Sciences. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity um, and an honor to be in your company. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am Kamran Bukhari. I am the Director of Strategy and Programs at the Center for Global Policy. Um, I will share uh, Ovamer's initial comment that I don't know where to begin. I'm just overwhelmed with so much information, so much rich information uh, and, and knowledge and wisdom. Actually, wisdom is the right word uh, from uh, our brother Anwar Ibrahim here, uh, that I, I just don't know where to begin, but I, will, I have to begin and I have to end, so I will try. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that what is really uh, amazing in, in what um, Anwar Ibrahim has done along with his colleagues in his political party and the broader coalition that they formed is to move beyond uh, the, the narrowness that we see in, in politics and embrace the diversity. And, 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 in a, and, and it's difficult in a country where, yes, there is a Muslim plurality, but there's also a sizable Chinese minority and, of course, a sizable number of people from the uh, people who are from India originally. And so this is extremely remarkable, and, and it's something that to do this and to actually mend fences with old uh, rivals or, or people whom you have disagreed with. I'm, I'm talking about the current prime minister, uh, and, and that, is, that is also very, very uh, remarkable. And I think that um, good governance or conscientious governance uh, is something that is most needed. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm really heartened to hear this from uh, Brother Anwar Ibrahim. I think this will be a challenge moving forward for the ruling coalition as time passes because as long as you're in opposition, you're safe. You're the underdog, you're being hounded, you can claim that you are, uh, you don't, you know, you're struggling. Soon as you come into office, um, you sort of become a, uh, a prisoner of your own, if you will, discourse. 
and, and because you have raised expectations among your, amongst your followers, and I think that, and, and I don't necessarily think realism is bad or geopolitics is bad, so I'm going to use that. I think that the skillful leader uh, or, or, or uh, the skillful leadership, if you will, is one that sort of manages expectations of the public while they're trying very, very hard to dispense justice, while they're trying very, very hard to, to meet the demands of the public, whether it's socioeconomic justice, whether it is uh, you know, claims of prior abuse of power, and, 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 and people have grievances and they need to be addressed, especially in, in this you know, era that we live in, where you know, we're dealing with very large, diverse populations. And I think the, uh, that in this respect, Malaysia is a unique uh, model. And, and, and we always talk about models, and we always talk about how we can transfer lessons learned from one context to another. And, and I hope to be proven wrong, but I think that we need to be realistic that there is a geopolitical reality called Malaysia, which has its own demography, its own ge geography set of resources. And so if other parts of the Muslim world have, uh, are, are, is going to learn from the experiences of, of uh, Brother Anwar Ibrahim and, and his colleagues, I think that we have to be mindful that in Muslim majority countries, we're not worried about inter-religious diversity, inter-ethnic diversity, as is the case in Malaysia. The biggest problem is intra-Muslim diversity, where we cannot come together because there are just so many madahib, so many schools of thought, political parties, ideologies, you know, f uh, if you will, personality clashes, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I think that that is something that the rest of the Muslim world uh, where that's still struggling for establishing conscientious governance. To get to that point, they must first address the issue of that diversity. We talk of pluralism, but the fact of the matter is that uh, that is the thing that is most lacking in most Arab Muslim countries. Um, and then when religion and politics mix, we, you know, we, 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 we don't agree on, we actually agree on very little. And, and, and I think that the issue is that there is, there are those who are called Islamists and they have a view of how government should run or politics should be conducted. But then there are many who are Muslims, but they're not, they don't affiliate themselves with Islamists, so what's going to happen? So in the West, we like analytical categories. We, we want things to be neat, and so we say Islamists and secularists. I, I think secularists, there are secularists in the Muslim world, but I think that there's a lot, there are a lot of people in between the two poles who, and don't affiliate with either side in any strong way. So what does that mean? How are we going to achieve that, that harmony necessary to be able to get to conscientious governance? You need, you need harmony um, in that respect. I was very taken by the comment that uh, we need to update our, our discourse. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the idea of difference, the idea of disagreement, and, and, and the, the tolerance is, is, is just not there. Where, and, and you use the word confidence to be able to say, okay, so if we have people who are talking about marriage beyond the traditional realm of one man and one woman, how are we supposed to deal with it? And so there is almost, you know, there are very little signs that this is being dealt with in a sophisticated manner. Mostly it's just reaction, shutting it down. So a lot of people uh, are against autocracy in the Muslim world, and Weimar touched upon it. But the people who are on the other side and wanting to replace this autocracy 
have autocratic tendencies amongst themselves that when they come to power, they will exclude certain number of people. And, and that's something that, that, that the Muslim world and Muslim majority countries have to learn to deal with. And it's not going to be easy. And I think that the, the, uh, one of the things, the lesson that I am sort of walking away from, from today's gathering is that there shouldn't be fear. There should be confidence, as you said, to be able to say, OK, let people talk. And then through debate, through discussion, you know, may the, you know, the strongest opinion win. But you have to have a level playing field. So again, conscientious governance has an a priori prerequisite, a requirement, which is that people have a social contract. And they agree on, well, this is how we're going to operate. And, and, I, and this is going to be dif uh, different and for every single country. Uh, we, w there, many years ago, there was the hope of the Turkish model, the model of, under the current government. And that model is, is, is disappointing now because we have a, a government that w was what came to power in response to extreme oppression of a certain class of people who identified themselves as religious. Those very same people, that same political elite, is now in the business of shutting down op opponents. And that needs to be accepted. We cannot just tuck it under the carpet. It has to be accepted that, this, that those who were, or hopefully still are, the champions of democracy and, and good governance, they will allow dissidents to speak. And they will not sort of, they w we won't have a fallback into autocracy. Another point that I want to make, how much time do I have left? I've sort of. OK, great, perfect. It'll take only two minutes. All ideals, all ideals about governance, conscientious governance, are great. But we need to be mindful of the underlying geopolitics. And what do I mean by that? Constraints. There are only so many resources a government has at its disposal. There are only, th there are large populations, poor populations, that are there demanding justice. And as I said earlier, uh, they don't want to wait, partly because they've waited a long time, and partly because they look at the uh, new elite with hope and because of the promises made. But I think that one of the most underappreciated values in this world is the concept of constraint that we talk about establishing conscientious governance, we talk about good governance, but we must be wary of our constraints, the limits imposed not by anybody, but just the reality on the ground. No government comes into power with a clean slate. You inherit a reality. Now, you can keep complaining to cover for your own shortcomings, but in, in the long run, I think good governance and conscientious governance involves at least educating the masses so that they have a realistic expectation of a change and the pace of change. Because people, you know, we live in electoral cycles. And as we're seeing in this country, time is running out. And then the president finds himself really constrained that he promised, for example, a wall. It's not happening, or at least not the way he's thinking. So these are problems. So I think that there, there's a rhetoric, there's a, which is natural. I'm not saying that that's wrong. There is a need to get people to mobilize people in, towards your cause. But then there's a need to manage those people if you find yourself in the halls of power. So if, don't be surprised then and say, oh, I wasn't ready for this. So I think that conscientious governance requires managing public expectations. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to both of our discussants. We will now have a Q&A session moderated by Dr. Qamar al-Huda. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. First, I would like to ask if uh, Dr. Anwar would you like to respond to the immediate conversations or discuss it. So, well, we start off with that and then we open the floor. Can we do that? Yeah, just, just, uh, maybe the mic. <laughs> so my camera, uh, where do we begin? Uh, it reminds me of a love story. <laughs> you are too serious. You don't follow a love story. <laughs> There's a trouble with scholars, particularly Muslim scholars. <laughs> love story is a great movie about love. So where do we begin? Remember, you don't remember. It's too serious, guy. But anyway, side, you remember. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, I think um, I, I must thank thank them. I think it's very consistent. There's a coherent message here. Uh, first, the ideal of governance, which must be uh, appreciated, but then there are limitations of power and office. For example, I talk about dealing with the issue of grinding poverty or cultural corruption that has already become uh, uh, inherent in the body politic. Uh, you can dismiss. You, first, you can solve the issue of poverty in six months. Now they can you wipe out corruption in six months. I mean, so these are the stark realities. I think uh, the rest, I leave it to the uh, floor. Thank you. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and introduce yourself as we enter. Um, I see one here and hand here and hand here as another hand. We have um, an interesting and fascinating conversation with our discussants at Triple IT and our guest speaker on really this evolution of piety in politics or politics without piety or the evolution of of conscientious governance. And I, I would I was thinking as you were speaking the whole time just to, is that the uh, UN has these uh, SDGs, 17 SDGs to limit pro uh, to undo poverty, well-being, and health. And sometimes we, we focus on those objectives. But I think you're really speaking about a higher ideal of governance of conscientious that deals with ethics, strong ethics, and which means obviously goes back to Professor Abdul, uh, Abdul Amin Suleiman's you know, cost of education and where these ethics are grounded. So I just wanted to insert that perhaps that governance or good governance is not exactly perhaps what you were mentioning. It's, uh, you're speaking some 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 higher plane. But please, your your question first. We have a mic. If you need a mic, there's one here. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Edward. This is my name is Akif, uh, Aso's older brother. Um, <laughs> and um, I want to just start by saying, Dr. Edward, uh, when you when when your party won, and when you were released. I cried because in, in, as an American Muslim growing up, there are so few good guys taking leadership at the highest levels in our community across 67 countries. To have one who suffered so much but stayed so consistent was a real moment of pride for me. And I just want to appreciate that you put yourself through a lot that you didn't have to in order to arrive where you are. And many of us refuse to make that choice, to struggle, to be able to do something good with the time that we're given. Um, I also want to thank Professor Anjum for sharing this insight that our scholars refuse to criticize dictatorships for reasons I did not, couldn't quite understand. And you've made it much more crystallized for me that this is a problem. Um, so Dr. Anwar, you talk about uh, governance and what, what, what is required. One of the inputs, as you've said, is a, is, a, is a population willing to be critical of its leadership, willing to express its views in dissent, um, which the Malaysian community find, uh, did this last election. Whether educated or not, to be able to express itself in a way that can affect change. Uh, uh, what I'm noticing is, and, 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 and uh, express itself, towards moving its country towards justice or its community towards justice. Uh, in, in America, uh, you know, we have freedom of speech, we have education, we have an opportunity to express ourselves vocally. Uh, we're seeing injustice in America, we are quiet. We are seeing justice in countries where our parents are from, we are quiet. Um, 
And the young people in our community are noticing that. They're noticing that we're not standing up to the way the, the Saudis and the Emiratis are destroying Yemen. We're not standing up to, uh, we're not saying anything when we see others in other communities oppress um, other Muslims and they're starting to reject the current leadership in America and the institutions in America. So given that um, you, know, you started your talk today by focusing on the, 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 the need for expression as an instrument to drive good governance in the right direction, what is your advice to us here in America where we have freedom of speech, where we have education, where we have an opportunity to express ourselves, how should we play a role in the larger Muslim community to advance our countries towards a more good governance model? Yes, let's do that. Let's have another. Uh, yes, Ali, please, first Ali, and then we'll go to you. Uh, my name is Ali Ramadan Abu Zakuk, and uh, welcome, uh, Brother Anwar, again. Since 67, I think. MashaAllah, you're still lo looking young. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, two questions. The first one is that I like it, your, uh, you know, the stress about the issue of maqasid and putting the conscientious government as part of the maqasid which is, I think, something that uh, IT and uh, scholars should really develop because that is something beyond uh, the regular classical maqasid that we know about. Uh, my other question is that uh, how do you imagine or can you foresee a role for Malaysia, for Malaysia to play in the OIC, for example, mm -hmm. the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in, in general, but in particular, in the ISISCO and UNESCO, because they do uh, stress the issue of education. And I know that it is very classical, very dormant, in a, in a, so, so to speak, but they need some kind of an injection of ideas like the ones you have just uh, you know, proposed and the ideas of the good governance that we are, inshallah, expecting from the Malaysian experience to be emulated in uh, other countries of the Muslim world or the world at large, because it is a uh, human experience. Thank you. Just next to you, yes, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, my name is uh, Abdul Mawgood Dardiri. I am uh, a former member of the Egyptian Parliament, uh, and I have just a very quick story to share. Uh, I visited Malaysia a couple of times, and one of them I was invited by AMNO, the government. And uh, while I was there, I was invited to hold a press conference in the Malaysian parliament in support of Dr. Anwar's release. And here I was, I was in a very critical situation because I was invited by the government that was imprisoning <laughs> Dr. Anwar to s demand Dr. Anwar's uh, release. And at that time, I'm coming from Egypt. President Morsi is in prison. So I had an ethical position. I was very concerned. I consulted. I made a stakhara, <laughs> and I decided <laughs> to go ahead for it. So we went. We made that press conference. It was great. After we're done with the pre press conference, the interior minister called and said, I would really like to meet you. So we went and we met and we, we it was really, it was really amazing arrangement at that time. Uh, out of my Egyptian experience, where we have now more than 60,000 political prisoners, including the first ever elected president, Dr. Morsi. When I am rethinking the situation, I, I see that uh, negative, tribal, divisive politics is one main cause for despotism and autocracy. Uh, is there a way of having, if, is there a way of a positive tribal politics, uh, by tribal I mean political parties, within a democratic framework? Uh, and my uh, last comment is, 
uh, if all politics is local, uh, where do you see the Muslim Democrat movement uh, is going in the rest of the world? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question and uh, combine these questions so Dr. Anwar can respond. Yes. Dr. Ibrahim, it's always a pleasure to see you here in Washington. My name is Raghid. My question is the following. Dr. Hisham described you as a man of forget and forgive. And you talked about reconciliation. And you gave us the example. And we all know the example of your relation with Dr. Mahadir. And uh, the way you reacted to it. And the, mm, when you accepted the reconciliation and now you are both in power, and inshallah next year we will welcome you here as a, the new prime minister of Malaysia. Apart from the human part of this story, which is very nice, but is there here like an inspiring message, an inspiring advice maybe you can give for the Arab world? For instance, let's talk about Islamist and Arab nationalists when, they, when one of them becomes in power. Maybe there's an advice you can give them that if they can follow on this story, not try to alienate each others and marginalize each others. And because when they did so, you see the results. You know who's there. They are both out now. So what's your advice in this regard? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll give Dr. Ibrahim <laughs> a chance to answer four of these questions. The other colleagues, the other academics, they can answer better. Uh, they will help me on this. Um, Akif asked about what is expected from the Muslims in America. In all my <coughs> uh, exchanges and discourse with Isna, and the party, MSA those days, we all see that you are in a unique position. Uh, but don't work from the ghettos. Be part and parcel of the mainstream America. I remember uh, the Turkish government and the British government organized a conference for Muslims in Europe. And the only two guests outside Europe was myself and Sheikh Harawi. So we discussed, and the both our message is, you are not an Algerian or Nigerian or Pakistani or Indian. You must express on behalf, uh, as part and parcel of your community, where you live. Um, so that is a big step. But if you do that, you express your right. For example, when our friends here express even a little support for me, it means a lot that you have uh, American citizens, but uh, Muslim organizations, who take a position and not uh, become mere spectators. And that would mean a lot. And you have the freedom. You can't do that from most of the Muslim countries. Uh, so I, th I still view it this positively. I, you can I can give a long lecture about my uh, position vis-a-vis -vis American hegemony or imperialism, etc. But I think that we also must be uh, uh, frank to admit that there is that uh, freedom. I mean, you can, uh, you know the limitations too, but then this is unique because not many countries would allow you to express these views regarding politics here or politics in the Muslim world. So do it as to the best of your ability. Now, Sheikh Ali, well, I agree with you. I mean, that is why I, I said, whether it's banking or governance, you must relate to the higher objectives of the Sharia. I think the, f no, the failure, the one of the major flaws among uh, some of the traditional scholars is to discuss, including banking or governors or hurud, without looking at the higher objective, the bigger framework. What Makas is all about is peace and security, is economic advancement, is educational standards, or what is termed as democratization of access to quality education. And I happen to serve as board member of UNESCO and president of the General Conference of UNESCO uh, many years back. And I, I, I think. Um, we need to utilize all this context possible and be part and parcel. We, we can express our differences, but this um, bifurcation between uh, Islamists and secularists to the extreme should not happen. I understand, the, the, for example, 
my limited understanding about uh, Egypt. Um, it's quite different from Malaysia. Because Malaysia, the most secular will pray and will not insult Islam. You see? And they're familiar with Islam. So it is not secular as laicite or secular in the notion that people understand. Uh, so are the Islamis. Many Islamis are as Malays, as culturally. Malays is a bit, uh, I'm, not, not, I'm not saying confused, but then <laughs> diluted in a sense. Uh, that is why the battle is not uh, too much ideological. Uh, and, and in the last elections, uh, well, the, from the time I led the opposition, uh, after coming back from the States uh, in 2008, after the first initiative, is to craft a clear agenda. That's what we mean. This is what we mean. So that we can engage and interact not only with the Muslims, but also the non Muslims, clearly. Because non Muslims, naturally, the, sus the, the suspicion and the prejudice against Islam is quite strong. It's quite compelling. It's not only in the West, because the, the Islamophobia can be extreme in the West. But the inherent uh, suspicion is there, partly due to the failure of Muslims themselves. Uh, okay. Now, uh, Abdul Mangu, thank you very much. And I, I saw that. In fact, my wife told me this Egyptian MP <laughs> <laughs> was <laughs> persuaded to come up with this statement. But the first to whisper to me was, uh, because it's not reported in the media, but you know, in the social media, so everybody knew. Uh, was by a prison guard. She said, sir, sir, somebody from Egypt support you. I said, well, thank you, I see somebody. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so I did uh, uh, talk about um, the, uh, how do we deal with the, uh, within democratic form. Uh, you see, uh, I don't have the answers. Because uh, you see in the probably Arab, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> you see, the, uh, probably the Arabs have strong views. You know, I mean, uh, it, it can be seen as, as something positive, but because of the this cultural trait, they, they are a bit tough. <laughs> so they ask me, you see, but you are Malay, but I, you are Malay, you know, how come we see you a bit uh, radical, a bit uh, loud? I see all my friends are Iraqis and Arabs. <laughs> 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 that explains why I'm a bit loud. Compared to a Malay who's very assuming, culturally polite. <laughs> you see? <laughs> Acculturation. Uh, yeah, because otherwise, you'll never be heard. With Ali, with uh, Sham, and you know, you're in the meeting. And they've all been uh, talking, and you are just, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Chairman, can I express my views a bit? <laughs> they, they wouldn't look at you. And they say, Mr. Chairman, I have something to say, please. That's the only time that you can hear. <laughs> anyway, the, the <laughs> jokes aside, um, uh, you know, when you deal with uh, ruthless dictatorial regimes, it's, of course, very, very complex. Um, is there a glimmer of hope? Yes. After all, the Shah of Iran could be toppled. Yes, there was the Arab Spring. It did not result in a positive, uh, in a positive sense. But I am sure um, it has generated some sort of uh, awareness uh, as, you know, who said this uh, conscientization? I mean, the uh, awareness of uh, tawaiya, uh, uh, more awareness, which probably, inshallah, not very long. I'm a democrat in spirit. I only believe that this human trait. Who wants unfreedom? You are born to be free. I mean, whether it's, uh, you, uh, you, you talk about Jeffersonian ideals or Islamic ideals. Who wants to be um, their life, their future, to dress everything to be so dictated? Because no, it's part of, of um, the essence of uh, mankind. So I think uh, those uh, kleptocrats and dictators you know, will soon learn. 
unfortunate that the American foreign policy, which is expected to uh, say more, um, doesn't seem to say more because they believe in, in <laughs> building walls than uh, the destroying walls. But, uh, but there's again something interesting. Only in America can you come to America and criticize the president. Uh, you can do that in Egypt if you can g go out. <laughs> All right. And now, um, Rahi. Oh, experience. I mean, I, I did uh, allude to this in the sense what, what, what advice can I give me? The, the best uh, can be decided by the Arabs themselves. But I think if uh, anything that could be learned, not only by the secularists, but also the so called Islamists, is also to understand that you are dealing with humanity. You can't take too ideological, doctrinaire a position. And um, this bifurcation will not help, in a sense. Of course, you'll be criticized. I mean, you have rightly said, for example, many of my friends say, Anwar, when you were the president of the Islamic youth, you were very clear on Islamia and uh, you know, and now you seem to be talking about um, Muslim society, societal reform, and working together. They must understand. Firstly, that was when I was twenty-one, <laughs> and now I'm seventy-one. <laughs> but do you? Compromise on the core principles and values. Rejecting corruption, oppression. Wanting a country that is peaceful, just for the Muslims and non-Muslims in the country. That, would, that believe strongly in ethical values, which I understand. I mean, Islam, in that sense, believe in a strong intellectual and cultural tradition, then I don't compromise. No. But they say, but you, you are a chameleon because um, you, you quote Shakespeare in New York and said the Quran in the villages. I say, I'll be stupid to quote Shakespeare in the villages <laughs> and, and <laughs> Quran in New York. <laughs> Uh, well, of course you do, but then this way you articulate the vision. But whether it's in the village, in the remote parts of Malaysia, or in New York, do you alter the core values and principles? You don't. So that is my point in my defense. But it doesn't stop people from ridiculing and um, criticizing our position or approach. I mean, maybe to talk about... I was addressing the staff just now about publications that abuse and attack Shakespeare as anti-Islamic. I find it odd. I still consider, although Harold Bloom may consider Shakespeare as the core of, of Western canon, I go beyond that. I think he's, he's, he's a universal man. He talks about humanity. I mean, the person who has... Um, as a, as a real genius who can understand humanity. Oh, he is not a Muslim. I'm Dombi La Gaddafi. He calls him Sheikh Ul what? Sheikh Zubair. Sheikh Zubair. <laughs> yeah, but not ma fortunately in the Islamic world, we don't have too many Gaddafis. <laughs> so, so I think um, it, it, we, we uh, start the difference. I mean, I make no apologies to say that I believe students to understand humanity must read Shakespeare. It's unrivaled in terms of contribution. But does it mean, therefore, that I would reject the cl Islamic classics? No. But you see, this is the approach uh, which we, 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 we think we need to promote. Thank you very much. Thank you. The discussants want to add anything? Yes. You don't? Come on, no? <laughs> okay, that's good. Don't want to follow that act. Okay, I know there's at least a couple more questions, and we have uh, a few more minutes, yeah? So I just want to go in the back and come back. Yes, can you introduce yourself and uh, ask a uh, 
Yes, in the back. Here, right here. This gentleman right here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Bob Morrow, uh, former uh, U.S. Foreign Service officer, and now with uh, the Adams community. Um, because I'm foreign service, I, I would like to think about governance not just as internal, but as something which involves your foreign neighbors as well. Um, and we've seen of late, uh, China is becoming far more aggressive in the entire region. You know, you've got um, military bases in the South China Sea. You've got the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, where they're really pushing on. Um, and so many, so many Muslim countries, um, Malaysia included, um, are the targets of this spreading Chinese influence. Um, I wondered if, while you were sitting in prison, reading and, and reflecting, uh, were you? Did you give any thought? to what this could potentially or portend uh, for Malaysia and other countries, not only in Southeast Asia, but the Islamic world in general. Especially given, you know, right now, the, the Chinese have a horrific um, campaign against the, the Uyghur um, up in um, uh, Xinjiang. Uh, they've, they were instrumental in moving against the Rohingya in Myanmar uh, because of the, the, the efforts to try to, to push that Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Dr. Mahathir, when he went to China, you know, talked about canceling some of the uh, the projects. Um, the Chinese are really trying to to push. So, uh, and I think if they succeed in becoming and taking hegemony in the area, uh, you know, th they they don't have a good record in terms of dealing with uh, with people from Musl uh, the Muslim faith. So, I want to know if if you've given some thought to that and what would be the best way that Malaysia, the United States, other countries can deal with the challenges that that's going to clearly um, result in, in in the coming years. Thank you. And another question up here in the front by Iman. Uh, Armando Dean Ahmed, the Minority Freedom Institute. Uh, I w wanted to uh, turn to an interesting question that was posed by Dr. Omavar, <coughs> who, who could be against Adel? Uh, I don't think people, I don't think anyone is actually against Adel per se. It's the definition of Adel. It's a comprehensive term that covers both social justice and the rights of, of, of property. So my question to you, and I don't mean to put you uh, on the spot, because I know you're going to be in a difficult situation once you have to start uh, governing. But nonetheless, if you would like to address the question, how do you envision protecting Adel in, in, in Malaysia? What policies would you advance? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, one more here. Yes. Uh, Nadine Yusuf from uh, U.S. Agency Global Media. I have questions. Um, what is the first thing that you would do as Prime Minister F, uh, of Malaysia? And uh, will you be Prime Minister of Malaysia when? <laughs> oh, yes. Another gentleman here, yes. <laughs> my, my name is Charles... Nice, easy question. Testing me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's it, right? There's no other hands up. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Malaysia vis a vis China. I mean, Dr. Mahathir have taken a position that I support that um, whilst we depend on trade and the bilateral relations with China, we need to review some the other the projects, uh, dubious dealings with companies. Of course, the Chinese, particularly the Chinese Communist Party, who's in, in, in touch with me, say, don't blame the Chinese government uh, because it is the Chinese companies that deal with it. Notwithstanding, uh, Mahade takes the correct position. That is, when the economy does not allow us to go through this huge mega project with exorbitant <coughs> price increase, then we have to renegotiate or if we fail, we cancel. Because the, is, uh, Ill, uh, the country can ill afford. And number two, if the deals are questionable and dubious, is the right of any government to review. Uh, although there are okay, um, some agreements, 
already signed, duly signed previously. I, as uh, in my experience in government in the past, would always say we will honour all commitments. Yes, but we have reasons, compelling case, that the agreement signed, uh, which is dubious, or um, through bribery, bribery, etc., that we can always question. And that, that's, I think, the position. On the South China Sea, we have taken a position that we will defend our territory. It can be a small country, but the best option, of course, to work with the other small countries in ASEAN to defend our security position, particularly because um, we cannot expect the United States, given the situation now, to be more uh, positive uh, with regard to the region. Uh, but with China, we have to continue to engage because it is a very strong neighbor, powerful neighbor, but a very strong economy. For our survival, we need investments, trade with the Chinese. What happens uh, with the uh, issues like uh, the uh, the treatment of Uyghur. I mean, we have been criticized, and I've said that before, because when uh, some of the Uyghurs were sent to Turkey with the arrangement with uh, President Tayyip Erdogan, we were, of course, questioned. But my defense to the Chinese is, look, uh, there are some humanitarian concerns, and the Malaysian public is fully aware and want us at least to secure uh, safety uh, or so safe return for some of them back to uh, Turkey. It's not an easy uh, process, but I think uh, in, in at least even in private, we did express, or, or we would require the Chinese to do and explain, um, because the allegations is now more in the open, uh, and, and um, this engagement with the Chinese uh, should not bar us from raising questions uh, or issues which affect the, uh, not only the interests of our country, but justice for any community. Now, issue of uh, Adel, this, the question is from Ahmaduddin, I mean, <laughs> who, who is quite uh, pronounced in his views on this. But I think, um, uh, you know, uh, in the past, uh, this policy sometimes Obscured. We have the majority relatively poorer and the minority doing extremely well. So policies had been introduced in the past that uh, is perceived as discriminating against the minority. So it's a very complex situation here. But as a policy, since 2007, I have called for the dismantling of what I consider as obsolete new economic policy, which is race-based. I'm for helping the poor, the marginalized, the majority of whom are Muslim, Malays, but it must be need-based, which means if you have pockets, uh, poor Chinese in the urban area, the depressed area, need to be treated equally well with the majority Malays and the minority Indians in the estates. So if it is need-based, we uh, introduce a policy to help. For example, our priority is to alleviate poverty. But then I think the most, uh, most uh, Malays will benefit, which means the majority in terms of numbers, in terms of allocation, will benefit the Malays. But because it's a need base, you cannot discriminate. After all, affirmative action policies is accepted. You say it, m it must be based on merit. I agree. You cannot appoint uh, mediocre semi-literates as uh, ministers and leaders. But if you talk about, <laughs> this applies to all countries, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, if you talk about um, meritocracy, you must realize the best schools in uh, New York were some of the more remote areas. I mean, America has been different in terms of infrastructure. But in our country, you want to see must be equal competition. You can't. 
The best schools in Kuala Lumpur, but some remote schools in Kapit, in the remote uh, hinterland in Sarawak. It's not fair. So, what is fairness back to John Rawls? I mean, what's justice? It's fairness. And a fairness means to all. You cannot, you cannot discriminate. If you talk about justice, you cannot discriminate. Based on religion or race. You can't. Uh, because uh, dealing with poverty, the Islamic tradition has been very clear. Never question whether your neighbor is uh, a Jew or a Muslim or Christian. It doesn't matter. So I think that principle we will have to follow. Although it's, it's, it's a difficult position because we will only take some Malay demagogues who say, look, Anwar is now has uh, given up on the Malays, which is not true. I'm very concerned about the plight of the Malay majority now. But our policies must not be discriminatory, must not be race-based. But our affirmative action policy in terms of uh, dealing with the issue of poverty, inequality, must be transparent. I mean, we say now we are promoting digital economy. We are uh, training, uh, giving opportunity to new entrepreneurs. I mean, you must allow for a adequate, fair participation of all. Because otherwise, entrepreneurship in terms of IT and digital economy is only one race. And a society cannot be sustained. That's why sometimes the elites fail to realize this. They only talk about their position, their interest, their race. They forget to, uh, to uh, or ignore the fact that the vast numbers of fishermen and uh, uh, farmers who are very poor, that must be dealt with. A majority are Malays, but there are many Chinese. In my constituency, which I uh, represent, I visited, for example, Malay fishing villages, which is really, really, really saddening. It's very poor. But there are Chinese fishing villages, Indian estate workers, who are equally poor. And I cannot discriminate because I want to deal with the issue of poverty, regardless which race. And there's a clear policy when it comes to Adil. And also judicial independence, which means that you treat any person according to the law, not because uh, of his race or his religion. Justice must prevail. Uh, between Makhasid and Makhasad, Charles Batu is the best person to answer. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I say is, finally, it is what is religion after all? If you don't have a uh, sense of compassion and justice. Similarly with Islam. How do you talk about Islam? No, we don't care. It's, a, it's the law, it's this. That means there is no justice and compassion. So the maqasid is the higher objectives of what Islam uh, promotes, which means peace, security, uh, and justice for every citizen. And you talk about Omar Abdul Aziz, essentially is that. Of course, in his dialogue with uh, Malik, his son, which is uh, in Shatibis of Mawafaqat, is, yeah, don't be hasty, my son. La la ta'jal, or ta'jal, is it? La ta'jal, ya bunayya. Don't be hasty, my son. Why? Security is paramount. I mean, this is, I think, is very essential because the issue of fiqh awlawiyat is also uh, central in, in the thesis of uh, Kharadawi, that uh, the list in the order of priorities. Um, so I think if you talk, ask uh, Makase to summarize, I would say that um, you cannot start talking about uh, religion and the rule of relevance of religion without looking at the broad framework. What is justice, security first, and justice for everyone. Because otherwise, you'll be talking in the legalistic fiqh mentality. There's always a problem which we have been debating for years. I was with Rashid uh, Ghanusi and the Utuglu in uh, Doha last week talking about Malik Ben Nabi, mm -hmm. societal reform. 
and he was lamenting at the issue of reading the Quran, but no sense about societal reform. And of course, he was criticized by Sayyid Qutub on that. And, but I think given that scenario, he was right. He was not undermining the importance of the Quran. But he said, you can memorize the Quran, but you are blinded to the injustice and the corruption in the society. So that's why he says, read the Quran, but you must understand, appreciate his message, and call for societal reform. Wallahu a'lam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Well, well uh, assalamu alaikum again. Brother Anwar, you said every time you come to triple IT, you go back to prison. <laughs> By the way, not many people know that Anwar was imprisoned not twice, three times. In the 70s, he was also imprisoned. Why were you imprisoned in the 70s? Uh, I supported the plight of the rural uh, poverty and, all, uh, and uh, robber smallholders. And so I just supported, and uh, so they put me two years in jail without trial. Mahadur also, right? No, at that time is Najib's father. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, this time I think with the prayers of everybody here, you go back from Tirupal IT to be the Prime Minister of Malaysia, inshallah. <laughs> so may Allah bless Anwar, may Allah bless Malaysia, may Allah bless America, may Allah bless the, his cousins. May Allah bless the participants. May Allah bless me as well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.